Well, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day in Ojai. A little bit of echo in the sound, but Carl will fix that. <clears throat> A couple of things I want to say. I'm going to try not to be too long-winded this morning, but there's a couple of things I want to say. One, I want to uh, kind of clarify a little bit what I was speaking about last night. Um, be a little clearer on it as to what I actually was intending to communicate. I tend to get caught up in conversations and lose my way. Um, I'm not the most uh, disciplined speaker in the world. When I spoke about the fact that the, about what to me is a fact, that the, in the realm of, uh, of sacred teachings and spiritual aspiration and, uh, and uh, anything in that general basket, when I, when I suggested that they had uh, failed to be of any much use to us. It's not only them. What I was actually speaking about is the fact that we have, over the last 5,000 years, tried a whole lot of stuff. We've tried uh, political solutions, financial solutions, religious solutions, spiritual solutions, uh, entertainment solutions, power solutions. We have tried pretty much everything within our the range of our ability to try to do something about the fact that being a human being just doesn't feel right. There's just something wrong here. And it's not only in the spiritual and religious realm that we've done that, and it's not only in the spiritual and religious realm that we've failed, but when I say that we've failed, I mean that we have failed. All of us. In all of those worlds, there are exceptions to the failure. And even in the world of making a lot of money, trying to get money in order to uh, be free of the fear. I'm certain that there are a number of people over the ages who have amassed enough wealth to break the spell for, in some way, just uh, because of the idiosyncratic nature of their own mind and their own understandings and so forth, and the way in which the acquisition of wealth eased some, something that it allowed them to get a glimpse of their actual nature. Same with politics, same with religion, same with, with uh, war, same with it all. So that I'm not singling out the spiritual and religious realm as the, that's the area where we have really lost our way. We've lost our way from the very beginning. Everything we've tried has turned to dust in our hand. Everything. Us, not individual beings among us, but us, the human community. And that's just the case. You look around the world and you can see that we have failed. We have not found a solution to the perplexing problem of being a human being. Afflicted with a, a, um, a disease that we are unaware of. Operating on the assumption that we, there's just something, about, and by us, when I say me, for example, I mean this personality, the whole um, conglomeration of traits and beliefs and attitudes and relationships and so forth that, and in history that constitute this personality. When I look around and there's no question that we failed. You know, look at the world. We failed. We have not solved this problem in, in well, 100,000 years or so that we've been human beings, but most especially in the last 5,000 years since the beginning of recorded civilization and the, and the more 
mindful way of uh, understanding what's going on with us, the more accurate way of of uh, feeling of you know of grasping the fact that we're unhappy and miserable, and we need to do find something to get rid of that unhappiness and misery. And you just look around, you can see we failed. That's not. That's just the case, and it's not one one part of us and not another part of us, it's all of us. It's the human creature that has failed to find a solution until now. And I just want to make that clear, and, and, uh, uh, and to me, as I said, it's just simply the case. I think one of the reasons for that is that, and this too will resonate in, in some, some with some uh, spiritual or sacred teachings and so forth. But I think the reason for that is because of the, the strict individualization of human activity that itself is a consequence of the fear. I am alone. I am on my own. I've got to find my own way. And even if my, finding my own way means joining up with a whole bunch of other people and feeling good about that, I'm on my own. My, my relationship with life, my, the possibilities of satisfaction and fulfillment in life are on me, and I am deeply flawed. I know it, I can't do anything about it, and I just have to find something that will give me some hope, some, some passing uh, pleasure, some uh, consolation for the underlying unsatisfactoriness of human life. And it's that individualization of the search for libera liberation that is perhaps the most crippling and most destructive uh, uh, effect of the fear of all. Because we are not, we are certainly, as I sit there, as I sit here, aware of myself, I am certainly am an individual human being. There certainly is an individual uniqueness to this personality to this way of relating to the world and so forth. But I'm not alone. I'm here with you. I'm never alone. We, if we reflect on it a little bit, I'm sure that anybody can see that we are affected by other people's misery, that we are affected by other people's uh, psychological disturbances. That if you, if I'm sitting here in a room of people, and if you are all feeling like you're, you are missing on something, or you haven't got what you came for, or you don't understand what's happening to you, and you're, you're deploying, and, and it's not like there's no sense of, a, of choice in this, you're just automatically deploying the defenses and the, the, the efforts at acquisition and so forth that have formed, your, that formed in your personality over all the years. And whether I am aware of it consciously or not aware of it consciously, that misery seeps into this consciousness. That misery affects the experience of life here, locally. Our boundaries between each other are porous. We have boundaries. There is a unique individual here, but those boundaries are porous, and they're especially permeable to the, 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 the presence and consciousness of misery and dissatisfaction and hopelessness and things of that nature. So when we, and, and all of that, of course, feeds the fear. And it feeds the, the underlying feeling that I have got to protect myself from all this stuff that's going on. I have got to find a way to uh, armor myself and, and get myself together and I get my own ways of finding satisfaction and fulfillment so that I am holding on to them tightly and even though I don't know that you're affecting me, I have got to keep your misery away from me. I cannot 
I cannot go forward except as this individual human being. And not only as this individual human being, less than that, as this individual personal structure. I have got to keep that going and that's where I have to find the solution and that's where I have to find satisfaction and fulfillment. And in that, that um, cave of individualized existence, some folks manage to break free. And you may notice that those folks who manage to break free, for the most part, they kind of head for the hills. Some of them don't. Some of them try to be helpful. But most of them get away from people. The inclination is to get away from people. Because the, the, less, the less defensible your individual position is, as a result of having freed yourself of the fear that has constricted and contracted you all these years, the more open you are and vulnerable you are to the misery of others. This is compassion. And, mo and the, the greatest result from it is withdrawal from human contact. And the same is true in every realm doesn't matter whether it's spiritual, or religious, or anything else, in every realm, human individuals have managed to find freedom from the fear without necessarily having any um, intellectual understanding of what has taken place with them, and then follow the, the path of least resistance for an individual free of fear, which is mostly to get away from the rest of us, because the rest of us are a bummer, really. So there's nothing around that, and you know, there are, I'm not saying that this is, this is a, the first time this has ever been seen in the history of the world. It's been seen often in the history of the world, but little has been uh, found that can do anything about that. Really, you know, it's just the way it's been for 5,000 years at least. I seek liberation either through money, sex, drugs, rock and roll, spiritual enlightenment, religious uh, um, transcendence. I seek liberation from this misery of being a human being. But that's me. It's got to be me. And it's kind of actually a little, a little um, telling that even in the realms in which the, the, uh, the unity of all things is acknowledged and recognized, even in those realms, the individualization of the search for liberation is actually the most powerfully uh, locked in. It's me and my teacher. It's me and my guru. It's what, what I've managed to get or have failed to manage to get that counts here. I'm in this all alone. Well, I remember what that feels. Naked and alone and, and completely destroyed by, uh, stripped of all hope whatsoever. I know what that is. I'm alone. You're not alone. We're in this together, like it or not. And, you know, there's lots of reasons not to like it. I'm not <laughs> telling you the truth. <clears throat> so that's what I mean. It's, it's kind of that that I mean when I speak about the fact that we have failed for as long as we have been trying, and I'm counting that as 5,000 years, kind of the beginning of civilization and the, the starting to uh, the, the, um, uh, our relationship to religion, our relationship to sacred things changed about that time. We no longer were wandering around in the forest uh, looking for forces and so forth, we, be, we became uh, um, our understanding of the, our religious impulse became uh, different, became singular rather than plural. And our understanding of our relationship to society became different 
and everything changed about 5,000 years ago. And since then, everything has stayed the same. Really, everything has stayed the same. We are born, we think everything is going to be fine, or we, you know, we were born without any sense of anything being wrong except this nagging sense of the need to be always on the lookout, always uh, watching, always watching for the opportunities to get something or to, to defend against something. We grow up, we meet the world and, and see ourselves in this, uh, this misery, this, this hopelessness. Uh, the human life seems to promise so much, really. It seems to promise so much and deliver so little. Some of us get to the point where we just uh, wipe ourselves out. We're so disgusted with the false promise of human life. The other aspect of the of what we of what has uh, caused us so much trouble in this regard over the over time is the idea that the solution has something to do with psychology. That the solution, and, uh, and in spiritual, religious, I don't care, money, all those things, the, spirit, the solution has something to do with psychology in this way. I have to find an understanding of things that will clear it all up for me. I have to find the aspects of my psychology that are standing in the way of freedom and satisfaction and get rid of them. That the problem rests in, the cause of the problem is entirely within the psychology of the individual. And that's pretty much universal. And it just turns out to be not true. It's just not true. The psychology itself is corrupted and affected and diseased by the continuous presence of this underlying level of anxiety and, uh, and fearfulness about life, distrust of life. The psychology is shaped by the, the environment in which it appears, by the context in which it appears. That's where the psychology takes its directions from, if you will. There's nothing actually of the kind going on. But that's where the, how the psychology learns to be to react in certain circumstances in this way and other circumstances in that way, and so forth and so on. So the psychology is not the problem. The psychology is the symptom of the disease. Everything about the psychology is a symptom of the disease. All of my selfishness, all of my self-hatred, all of my hatred of others, all of my acquisitiveness, all of my hopelessness, all of my depression, all of those things, are caused by the disease, the underlying atmosphere and context of fearfulness and anxiety that shapes and informs the psychological structures as they come into being. And then we speak to those psychological structures, trying to persuade them that they're wrong, that they need to change their mind, that they need to get rid of that aspect of themselves and hold on to this aspect of themselves, that they need to get, get rid of the inclination to cling and hold on to things and instead have an inclination to let things be and be accepted. But that's crazy. It can't happen. It's like trying to, well, I don't know, it's like, like I, I can't even think. It's like trying to, to uh, talk ink into being transparent. And even though that, the, that is the case, and even though that has afflicted us for all of these years, still in all, in all of the failed ways in which we as a community of beings have failed to find solutions, every once in a while one of us finds it, stumbles upon it while trying to do something else, and the psychology is changed. Not like that, but it begins to, the, th these old ways of looking at things, the old points of view, the old relationships with things, begin to fall away. And new, uh, regenerated psychology begins to appear in its place. 
the new psychology, no more um, like uh, self-aware or or capable of doing anything in the old psychology, but the new psychology forming within a context of the welcoming of life, formed within a context that is free of the the nat formed in a context that's the natural human context for a psychology to appear in, free of the background of fear that contaminates and stains it, taints it. That's what I've seen in my life. That's what really hundreds, maybe thousands of people now have seen in their lives as a result of this simple, little, insignificant act of inward looking. So I still have remnants, psychological remnants of the many years and the, the, the uh, enthusiasm with which I embraced stupidity over those years. Still, I find from time to time I will notice that something that I had, something that I had just automatically responded or reacted with to a certain class of circumstances something that doesn't happen anymore. You know, the most dramatic of it, and, and this happened some time ago, but I'm going to say it because this is a really dramatic instance of what I'm talking about, and I want to be able to show you what I mean when I say that these things fall away, that they just disappear. There's nothing new that comes. They just disappear. I, all my life, um, probably not all my life, literally, but since the time when I was able to do so, I smoked Camel non-filter cigarettes. In all my life. I, how many years? Um, since I was probably 18, 16, maybe. And I continued smoking non-filter Camel cigarettes after the looking occurred in my own personality and after the the fear had dissipated, and after all of that had, had passed away, and I was uh, comfortable in my own skin and comfortable in my own life and pretty satisfied with what was going on, still I smoked Camel non filter cigarettes. Still. Even with Carla, after, Car after I married Carla, still I would go out on the porch uh, at night to have a last cigarette before coming to bed. And one night, I've told this story before, but I don't think you've all heard it. One night, I went out to have a last cigarette before going to bed, and as I got ready to light the cigarette, a, a very um, familiar train of thought, train of thought's a good <laughs> metaphor, a very familiar train of thought arose, with, which started with a feeling of some guilt and progressed to the the thought that, uh, well, yeah, I know, this is probably killing me, but it's too late to do anything about it. I've been smoking for all these years. There's no sense in trying to become healthy now in that regard. I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing and let the dice fall as they may. And now we go on and smoke. This time, a new thing occurred, and instead of that same old train of thought, a new train of thought appeared, which is very brief and very to the point, and it said to me, well, it may be too late, but it's certainly not too early. And I never smoked another cigarette. And there was no, no drama about it. You know, I, I used a patch for a while, and, but there was no drama about it, no big deal about it. It's just that I never again felt the need to smoke a cigarette, and I haven't since that day, which was, what, 2006, something like that? So that's what I mean about the way, and, and there are many other examples that I could recount, but I'm not going to bore you with them because they're, you know, personal things and not very interesting to people, just the way my, I used to think about things. I used to hate being around people. I used to, I, uh, it's just, there's... <laughs> And they just fall away, really. It's not like some big illumination will appear and wipe all the bad out and everything then will be good. Some new state will come. 
what actually happens is that stuff falls away and new stuff appears. Stuff falls away and new stuff appears. And we find ourselves quite against all expectations perfectly comfortable in our own lives. Not that life becomes any less difficult. Life is difficult. You know, it's a, it's a wild universe that we live in here. And life is difficult. But that's part of the, the richness of it. That's not something that causes, it, uh, oh my God, oh, not that again, not that again. It's part of the richness of life, the difficulties that, that uh, arise all the time. And the, the, there's a, a new, there's a dawning of a, and, and you know, I, 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 I think of it as a kind of waking up, although I don't use that word very often because I really don't want to, um, you know, confuse people. That, that this is something like always has been before. But it's very much like waking up. And once that occurs, much of what w went on before, even in the name of liberation, is seen to be an effort to go back to sleep, an effort to not be human, an effort to lose self-consciousness, an effort to end thought when the reality of being awake as a human being, sane and awake in a human life, is that our ability to understand what's happening to us in a practical and pragmatic way increases a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Our ability to, and, and the, there's a light of human intelligence that shines on circumstance as they appear which reveal their actual nature to us in a way that's much more effective and much more useful than when we used to try to figure out other things about them. And our, our ability to learn increases. Our love affair with learning. Learning anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be any big thing. Like, uh, I'm, I have, over the past few years, been, been cooking a lot. And I, every day when I cook, I learn something. It might be some little thing about, about uh, how to cut something, right? But that learning is that learning, the endless appearance of opportunities to learn things, is the greatest gift of being a human being. The conscious ability to learn things and recognize that you've learned and see how it uh, enriches and... and uh, uh, and makes you more effective in the navigation of your own life. And one of the things that we learn, well, we'll get to that some other time. So that the outcome of this looking is, and sometimes it takes a while for all the dirt to go away. For me, it took a very long time. For others, it takes less time. For some, it still takes some time and some considerable disturbance as the old soldiers begin to die away and go out kicking and screaming and uh, holding onto the curtains as they leave. But after that, when that's done with, when that's done with, the, the true exceptional gift of being alive as a human being with a human consciousness reveals itself in ways that you can't imagine, that have nothing to do, that are, that are entirely of this world, have nothing to do with otherworldliness, that are entirely of this world and our, our uh, comfortable seat in this world. The, so that in the end, we find ourselves as we are naturally intended to be, human creatures, alive in a human life, alive in a, in a, 
in a world of richness and diversity and, and surprise beyond all comprehension. Free of fear. Not, not stupid, you know. We still get scared about things that are scary, but free of that stench, that stinking atmosphere of fearfulness and anxiety that we have become accustomed to over the years of living in it. That, that sense of being at odds with my own life, of needing to constantly monitor everything that occurs, every experience to interrogate it, to discover whether it's something that is going to help me or hurt me, or like most things, just of no consequence whatsoever. That goes away. And it's not possible to... to it, it, the result is both so simple and ordinary and natural and so unexpectedly magnificent in its ordinariness and its naturalness that it's, uh, it's not really possible to communicate. But what we've found is that this is truly the birthright of all human beings and that there is no need to go through any kind of uh, preparation. There's no need to, to acquire any new understandings. There's no need to accept any new beliefs about something. You don't need to believe anything I tell you. Really, nothing. You don't need to believe anything I say about the way life is or about the way the looking works, about how the outcome is. You don't have to believe in the looking. You don't have to believe in anything. You don't have to abandon any beliefs. You don't have to understand anything. You don't have to abandon any understandings because the actual solution has nothing to do with persuading the psychology to the idea that it's wrong and needs to change. The actual solution is as simple as when you get, uh, when you take uh, antibiotics for an infectious disease. It's as simple and mechanical and uncomplicated as taking antibiotics for a disease. You look and you've done everything you need to do. And there will be a course of uh, confusion and recovery that follows upon that. And in the end, the fever will break and, and the sun will come out and everything will be fine. And whatever needs to be understood will be understood naturally and automatically as a result of the change that's occurred within your own uh, personal psychology and mind. Now that, that's what makes this different. Not all the stuff I've talked about, the fear of life, not all of the things about how we failed in the past, not any of that. What makes this different is the fact that it takes nothing except the, an act that itself is so easy and so natural, although we're, we're capable of turning it into, and I, I speak from direct personal experience. We are capable of turning it into a big drama and, and doing anything we want with it. But something is so simple and uncomplicated and needing nothing. That's what differentiates this from everything we've done in the past. That. Just that. And that's why, that's why I'm here today. And that's why we are uh, working as hard as we can and with as much uh, intelligence as we can muster to find a way to just bring this suggestion to the whole world. Just bring the idea to the world. It, it, it's my conviction that if we can get this, just the idea of this, in the minds of enough human beings that everything will turn out right, that everybody will go sane, and that we'll see a, literally a new dawn for humanity, just by taking this little bit of medicine, just by getting it into the ears of the people who, 
who uh, really desperately need to hear it. So that's what I'm saying when I talk about how we've failed. I'm not saying that, you know, we haven't. And I'll tell you the truth, especially within the realm of spiritual aspiration and sacred teachings in that realm, the people there have been heroic. It's not like I have uh, any kind of uh, negative feelings about the people in those realms and about the people who have themselves tried, tried, tried to get through our thick skulls something that will bring us the same relief that they have found. They're heroes. Really, they're heroes. It's not their fault. They were doing, as we all are, the very best that they can. Every human being on the planet is doing the best that they can, including those heroes who have tried so courageously to bring some truth to our poor, dark minds. Okay. I just wanted to clear that up in case there was any misunderstanding about what I felt. That's as close as I can get right now. So now if anybody wants to talk to me, this will be the time to talk to me. I'm done speaking, I think. <laughs> yeah, back there. No, you got to come up. I can't hear you back. Yeah. I can't. I can't have a conversation with you from here to there. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm up here. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, well. <laughs> it's good to see you up hi, here. What's your name? Thank you, Anita. Anita, hi. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, um, I'm kind of wondering. I have a, a friend who is believes that freedom is above everything, right? And... Um, feels that you can't really be, or he can't really be in a committed relationship because freedom, it would diminish the freedom. That's fear talking. That's fear talking? That's fear talking. And not to say that there are, that every personality, mm -hmm. even a healthy personality, right? Mm -hmm. It's not to say that there cannot be, within a healthy personality, mm -hmm. the preference to be on their own. But the, the saying, I cannot be in a committed relationship mm -hmm. because it would impinge on my freedom, mm -hmm. that's the fear of talking. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference to what I'm saying there? Um, kind of. I'm um, probably... I mean, we really are, mm -hmm. as human yeah. beings, oh, I... mm -hmm. unique. Right, okay. Right? D completely unique. Right. And, and there's no way of telling when the fear goes what the nature of that personality might be. You know, it might be a personality that prefers to be by itself. It might be a personality that likes to go out and dance. You know, there's just no telling. But when somebody says, I cannot be in a committed relationship because it'll impinge on my freedom, mm -hmm. that's the fear talking. Hmm. And there's no way to talk them out of it. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, because that that viewpoint has been settled in, and any attempt to talk that anybody out of a neurotic viewpoint mm -hmm. is a waste of time. It can only strengthen the neurosis itself. Mm -hmm. right? The only thing that can be done is to be free of the fear, and then the actual natural can I say natural nature. Mm -hmm. uh, the personality will reveal itself as it as it appears. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it seems to me that um, he was saying that you know, if in a sense, whenever he's with someone, he's with them fully and totally, uh, and then when they're gone, he's with it, whoever the next person is fully and totally, and it's kind of an intimate way in terms of relating, but and that enables him to do that, you know, to be able to be totally present with each person who he experiences, whether it's a man or a woman or whatever na the nature is of the relationship. Yeah, I understand. Know. Now we're getting too far into uh, an examination of the neuroses itself. Uh -huh. right? And that never gets us anywhere. 
Really, that really never gets us anywhere. Mm -hmm. it's, were you here last night? No, um, I didn't. Make Do you it. know what I'm talking about when I talk about looking at yourself? Uh, Have you been? I'm our... not sure exactly what you mean. Okay. Well, let, let me let me show you what I mean. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. When I talk about looking at yourself, I'm talking about something really simple, really easy, that's as natural as falling off a chair. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and that seems sometimes to be impossible. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is getting a direct taste uh, experience, the direct experiential taste of what it feels like to be just you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just you. Mm -hmm. Not the psychology, not your hopes and dreams, not your history, right. but just you. Right. Now, you are actually extremely simple. There's nothing much to you. The experience of you is uninteresting in the extreme. It's just a, just a, a background. Right. All right? Now, the way that you can look at yourself and the way that I am, I am asking people to do has to do with the ability to concentrate your attention. The ability that you have as a human being and this is a big thing, to deliberately move your attention from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. To, for example, like right now you could have your attention uh, focused on the weight of the microphone in your hand. Mm -hmm. right? You can see that you can actually kind of, everything else is still there, mm -hmm. but you can focus your attention on the way that microphone feels in your hand. That's, the, that's this really magical power to move attention. That's what we can do. That's an act that we can accomplish. And then, when you notice what it feels like, and like it doesn't feel like it, the saying of it. Moving your attention doesn't feel like moving anything. It just feels like, like the, that experience comes uh, in the forefront. Right. right? It's not like you, it doesn't feel like you're doing anything, mm -hmm. but as a result of doing it, that experience comes in the forefront of your experiential consciousness, right? right? Okay. So, now that you see that and you notice what that's like, you just take a, a half a second and see if you can't get just a direct glimpse of this feeling of you here. You, the person. What you call me. Now, whether, whether you, and I'm not even going to ask you, because whether you feel that you succeeded in getting that taste or not, you have succeeded. It's really impossible to try and not succeed. It's almost as if the trying is the succeeding. And what you'll find, and I think, you know, somebody asked me recently to talk about why I think this works as it does. And why I think it works as it does is because the, the, the movement of attention, which is the only thing you really can do, actually, is attend to what's present. The moving of attention to the feeling of you wipes out the false idea that you are in danger here. Because the truth is that nothing has ever affected you at all. Now, if I try to persuade you of that, that doesn't work, because it just doesn't. It's not possible to persuade you of that. This simple little act reveals, without an intellectual understanding, reveals this un indisputable reality that you have never been affected by anything. You've never been hurt. You've never been helped. Everything that has come and gone within you has been food for your experience, has been uh, opportunities to learn, opportunities to engage with experiential things, occurring circumstance, opportunities to learn, mostly. <clears throat> anyway, the, having done that, that looking, 
that act of looking, what gets in the way of the experience of life in a natural form is that background of certainty, unexamined certainty, that there's something wrong here. It may be because I'm involved with somebody who's not involvable. It may be because I don't like the way I look. It may be because I don't like the fact that I'm getting old. It may be all kinds of things, right? But that, that, that one look wipes out all basis for believing in that. And what happens as a result is that all the, the habits of behavior and the belief structures and the, the beliefs about relationship and so forth that were formed in order to serve that fearfulness, in order to protect you from what you actually need no protection from, all those things begin to go away. And a new natural human way of experiencing life begins to take their place. And that's what the looking does. And that's the act of looking I'm talking about is what we just did here a moment ago. And whether you know it or not, you've done all you need to do. Really. And I would really be grateful if you make an effort to let me know how things are turning out for you over the next, you know, few weeks and, and months and so forth. But that's what I'm talking about. And then the whole idea of understanding why another human being is the way they are, that whole project that has taken, that takes up most of, a lot of our attention, you know, that whole project just kind of collapses and things are, become very apparent. And it also becomes very apparent that it is the relationship itself and not the nature of the relationship in which the satisfaction is found. It's the relationship not only with each other, but with the things that come and go in life. That's where the satisfaction is, not in their particularities of the way they look. You follow me? I think so. Okay. So you're saying this little looking, you're just looking at Yeah. Me. and. Yes, at you. That's it. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is, uh, over, the, over the next period, you'll find that you'll do that again. You'll try to do it again, mm -hmm. whether, you, whether you want to or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it may, like I, it, some people have taken it and turned it into a kind of a practice, and that doesn't hurt it at all. It doesn't. No, it doesn't hurt it you know, where they'll actually decide, well, it's six o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get up and take a look at myself. Right. Other people just find themselves when they're checking out at the supermarket, getting that little glimpse again, you know, just moving their attention there again. Just kind of uh, uh, on the spur of the moment. The thing that, that seems to always be the case is that no matter what form it takes, once the first look is attempted, it continues for a while. It repeats for a while over time. The other thing that happens is that that uh, the, 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 per, the personality itself, your personality, the personality that consists in a whole conglomeration of attitudes and points of view and understandings and desires and aversions and so forth, that personality itself will begin to uh, uh, regenerate, become new, and the old will fall away. And that period can cause some considerable confusion. It, it, it goes away, whether, any, whether you do anything about it or not, it goes away eventually. But there are things you can do about it to mitigate and make easier that period of adjustment to the change that's going to occur within you. And, uh, and the best way to, and should you find interest in what's happening and you notice things happening that seem to be consistent with what I'm suggesting, you should go to our website. There's a lot of help there. There's a lot of people in the forums there who have been helping one another and helping people who are arriving newly for some time now. And there's a lot of information there that can be helpful to you. 
It's just one look dot org. And uh, and let me know. I'd really like to hear from you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Remind me of this uh, <laughs> of conversation. conversation. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks for coming up. Here, I'll hold that for you. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you just got to put it back on the seat. Oh, oh I'm supposed to put it on the seat. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, anybody else? Yes. I know your name, don't I? Mark. Mark. Nice I'm to see bad you with na- I'm really bad, bad with names. Until I've, had, you know, had a number of occasions. Nice to see you in person. It's nice to see you in person too. <laughs> I think I may be your first failure. <laughs> oh, well. And I've come to this awareness since being here that I think I have off and on been looking at myself for most of my life. Yes. And yet there has been no resolution of the fundamental problem of the fear of life. There's a, there's a, I, I let me just I tell you that it takes a purposeful decision to do the act. It doesn't have to be a big deal, but like with Anita, yeah. right, just the purposeful decision that that's what you're going to do is what's required. So that before it wasn't purposeful. Right. But it, but it's the same thing. Is that it's correct? Same, probably, I, you know, yes. I when you reflect so. almost self-consciously on yourself as being, it depends on what you mean by yourself. Let's let's see what it's like now, right? I mean, let's yeah. look now. Look now. Let's uh, again. Let's the, the the key. There's a couple key elements in this that I've been able that we have me and other people have been able to identify over time. One is that it takes a purposeful act. It takes a decision to do it. And because the fact of the matter is that there's never a time, actually, when you're not aware yeah. of the field of you. It's just that it is so insignificant that it is unnoticeable. So that Having recognized, you know, after hearing about the work, yes. and having recognized that has happened in the past, is just natural. Okay. Okay. It's just you're here. You're not. You're yeah. never missing. <laughs> you're never out of action. <laughs> so it takes a purposeful decision to do move the attention in that way. The attention again is the only thing you can do, and, and I say that pretty blat- pretty blatantly, but. If, you know, as you reflect on things, you'll see that that's the case. Circumstance itself is already here and in place before you even notice it. So you certainly can't yeah. have any effect on that. Right? The only thing you can have effect on is your attention. So it takes a purposeful act. The other thing, another thing about it that seems to be critical, is that you are that uh, what you are looking for, it goes by the first person pronoun, me. It's not self, it's not consciousness, it's not awareness, it's not anything of that kind. It is me. First person, me. That also seems to be critical. So, let's try. And, and the, the, the thing about attention is crucial. The, and and uh, the longer we are seeing results from this and say, hearing reports from this and having uh, uh, more information to reflect upon and understand things, the more we see the criticality of the power of attention, the power of focusing attention. So you have to take a moment and notice what it's like to focus attention. And again, you can do just the same as Anita did. Just focus your attention on the feel of the microphone in your hand. As I said, you'll see Everything else will still be there, but you can recognize what it feels yeah. like to be focused on something in particular. So just for a second, do that. And in the same way you did that, now see if you cannot get a glimpse of the feeling of you here. 
just a taste. Okay, that's the looking. Everything that went before might feel like it, but that's the act of looking. It's a simple, insignificant, natural act, but done with purpose, done with the purpose of accomplishing it. That's it. So we'll see whether you remain yeah. a failure. <laughs> and we're going to be together here for a few days, and we'll see uh, how this yeah. uh, unfolds over mm -hmm. these few days, if things change then. And as again, what can I, I can say, and especially in your case, since you're aware of the fact that you have yeah. noticed yourself over all these years, you, you'll, find, you'll find yourself doing this again. Not, you know, actually yes. deliberately doing it again and again and again over time. After a while, that'll pass away. The reason it passes away is the same reason that you have noticed it in the, in the past is because it's always here. It's really, there comes a time when it's just beside the point to make an effort to feel what it feels like to be you, because you're always aware of it. There's just not much of anything to pay attention to. So, there we go. Thank you. We'll see if we've turned a failure yeah. into a success. Now on a more philosophical bent, which oh. I know you like to avoid, but <laughs> I might as well bring it up okay. to it's purge okay. myself. <laughs> For me, my particular history and the uniqueness of my own apparatus, if I should describe it that Fine. way, the, the nub, the very core of my fear of life centers around this sense of separation. And that's what, when you, if I use my mind to reflect upon it, when you say you, that you-ness is my separation. And so this is why I feel maybe I haven't been doing it correctly. Because maybe I'm identifying my unis as the apparatus, which is separate. But I know you've said before that the unis we all share, it is the same nature of unis. Yes, but, and our, our feeling about that, when, when tainted with the fear, is neurotic. Our feeling about that, the fact that this is a simple, I am simple, yeah. I have, there's nothing much to me, and this must be the way everyone is, that itself is the, 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 uh, the relationship to that actual fact is threatening to the fear, threatening to the structure of protection and defense that has uh, come about. And, and it feels like separation, but... Yeah, separation. It feels like separation, but that's idiosyncratic. So it really isn't separate. When one contacts that you directly, it overcomes the separation, or it's, it not well, overcomes, it, it dissipates like a mist. It, sort of, but, but, but in this way, right? That, and this is something really to see, that most, the most... Um, noticeable effect of the loss of the sense of, uh, of separation from everything else is um, a desire to get away from everybody else because of, the, because of what I spoke about earlier. Yeah. It's not like the end of separation, the end of the, the sense of separation, the belief in separation, and it's, it's not that, but it, and what, what I'm talking about when I talk about that is the separate existence of human beings, not yes. just non-dual non -dual reality, which is a different matter. But that that sense of separation has protected you from the, from the, the misery of other people all this time. And it, and it obviously is also a hateful thing to you itself. Yeah. But it protects you from the influence of all the people around you. And that'll go away. And, but its 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 departure does not result in some new open-heartedness and just a love for all humanity and or anything of the kind. 
Mostly it results in a feeling of, oh my God, why is everybody so miserable? Why, why is all this pain here? What is going on here? What can I do? And for most, it, I don't know most, I might be overstating that, but for many, that causes them to physically withdraw. Since the capacity to psychologically withdraw has disappeared in them. So don't expect the, you know, like, oh, sweetness and light. This is a human yeah. life, and, and human life is difficult. So, so sp speaking to this in one other way, when you say you can't be helped or harmed, for me, this sense of separation, that can be harmed and it can be helped. And so, yes, it aren't can you, be. you're pointing to a place that is beyond that sense of separation. As long as you feel separate, then you're going to succumb to the fear of harm and help, aren't as you? As long as you are driven by the fear, you will feel separate. Yes. And you will, and, and that separation, since it, it itself is a disease, is, uh, is painful. It takes a lot of effort to maintain. The, the boundary and make it feel like yes. I'm apart from people. But it's the fear. It's not like, <clears throat> it's not that the sense of separation and the disgust with the sense of separation is the problem that has to be solved. The problem is the fear. Okay. And when the fear goes, all the stuff that's neurotic goes with it. But it takes some time. Okay. And so what is not neurotic is what remains. And Right. It was not neurotic is what remains. And there's a number of aspects of your personality yes. that will reveal themselves to be not neurotic. Yeah. And in areas in which, which uh, psychological engagement is required by, by the person, new, fresh, healthy psychological structures will appear that make, it, make your life uh, more accessible to you and more... Uh, capable of, you're more capable of navigating intelligently and seeking its rewards, the biggest of which is the endless opportunity to learn. So just to make sure I'm not misinterpreting what you're saying, this would not be tantamount to all of a sudden now you have a healthy ego. No. Okay. But, but it will get healthy. I got nothing it's, against uh, ego. Okay. Nothing. I am actually. I'm quite yeah. fond of ego. <laughs> you know, ego has gotten a really bad name. From but it might as well be healthy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Ego. Ego. It means I. That's what it means. It yep. means I. And the the confusion as to the of the sense of separation, the confusion of that as the problem that needs to be solved is what's called, the, what has caused the demonization of ego. But that's not the problem. That's a symptom. And when, and the, the, the sense okay. of, of separate existence is actually a great gift. It's, it's false, in a sense, right? Yeah. But the fact that it's false, in a sense, is of no consequence. It's a great gift. It's what makes human beings human, rather than, you know, worms and rocks and so forth. Nothing wrong with worms and worms and rocks, but that's what makes human beings human. And I ha so I have nothing against it. The fact is also philosophically that just as it is the case that the human creature consists in a um, uh, in an indefinite number of individual human consciousnesses, that's just the case. The same with non-dual existence. That's just the case. It is the case that all is one. But it has no meaning. It has no consequence to it. There's nothing to it that's of any use. It's just the case. And the, the, the yearning for non-dual yeah. consciousness is just a false trail. All consciousness is non-dual. The existence of... of uh, of, of things coming and going within it does, you know, like non-duality has no beef with duality. <laughs> it's only duality yeah. that has a beef with okay. duality. And uh, So when you're coming from the non-dual natural state, 
It's okay that the duality is there. It's a useful tool. Of course, tool. it's a gift. It's not a. Yes. It's in no way a problem. It's a gift. But coming from the dual state, trying to overcome it, is a mistake. That's right. That and that's that what just I've been leaves, trying to do my whole life. Of course, of course. And you can see if what I say is true. What I say is that that non-duality is just the case. It's not. Nothing changes as a result of seeing yes. that. Has no consequence to it. Then you'll see that. That yearning for non-duality itself is a symptom of the fear. It's a, and it may have, you know, it may have some um, some uh, it, it may have some of its force comes from the unconscious recognition of it being the fact and the feeling of contradiction between my experience of things yeah. and what is actually the case can inflame it and make it even more uh, powerfully uh, miserable. But it's the fear that does that. The fear is what keeps, tries with all of its heart to keep you separate from me. Tries with all of its heart to make sure that you don't experience what I experience. Because what I experience has got to be trouble. It's got to be something that's going to harm yeah. me. I have nothing to say over that. It's the fear. All of the yearning for solution, all of it, in, in the ways in which we have, have uh, focused it, all of the yearning for the yearning. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about that yearning. I'm very familiar with that yearning. All of that yearning is a consequence of the fear. It's all the talk of the fear, saying, yes, things are really terrible here, and this is what you need, or this is what you need. And if only you could have this, everything would be all right. When the fact of the matter is that you already are and have everything that you ever needed in order to be a human being, and to be a natural, sane human being guided by the intelligence of human, human intelligence. It's already the case. And that also is something that is by the by, acknowledged in a number of yeah. spiritual uh, utterances, most of which are perplexing and make no sense whatsoever when we're trapped yeah. in this yearning. Because, you know, it's like the, my favorite is the, the, the ferry boat crossing the Sea of Samsara from the shore of misery and suffering to the, the shore of enlightenment and, uh, and freedom from suffering only to discover that having traversed the Sea of Samsara to get there, where you end up is exactly the place that you yeah. departed from. Not something similar, but the actual place that you departed from. And the Zen school has a wonderful parable, Enyadatta. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Yeah. She thought she lost her head, and she goes berserk, trying to find <laughs> her head, trying to find her head, trying to find her head. Then she looks in the mirror and realizes the head was there all the all time. Along, yeah. <laughs> Very much so. And, and that's where the, it peaks out, you know, like yeah. the people that have, have been the guiding lights behind those ideas and those approaches are people who authentically yeah. were done with the fear. And in my opinion, because I, you know, it's perplexing that that would be the case. And my opinion is that they, actually didn't know what they had done, what had actually caused it, just like I didn't. And they tried to find a way to communicate it and try to find a way to speak about it that would be helpful to people by such things as yeah. these koans and, and things yeah. of that nature. But it never works. Well, it doesn't never work. Sometimes it works, just like sometimes money works. Fame works for some people, power works for some people, sex works for some people, but not many, you know, not very many, handful over the ages. Thank you, John. You're very welcome.
Anybody else want to talk to me? Hi, Paul. Hi. Good to see you. It's really fresh. Good to see you. <laughs> really good to see you, and Carla. Speaking of it, uh, you talked about it popping out, and you mentioned looking in the mirror. I do have a question about um, this experience that I think most of us have had, and certainly when you get to be our age, I think most of us have had, where you look in the mirror, and there's this kind of startle that happens for a split second, where you're looking, and you can see your face has changed, you can see you've aged, but it doesn't make sense. On some level, you know in your gut that something has it. Yeah, right. And I'm wondering if that, in fact, is a split second of this. Of course this. it is. It is. Yes, of course it is. And to tell the truth, I don't have that experience, and uh, which is another indication that that's what it is. Right. It's the, it's the, it's the right. reality, you know, right. saying, what? What? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, and it's funny because I never thought about it, but when you were describing it, mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, I kind of know what that is, but I actually don't have that experience. I look in the mirror and see this old geezer who... <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I've noticed that too, that that yeah. kind of falls away too. Um, and the other, the other question I had was around... Um, yesterday you talked about, last night you talked about wanting to turn the page on this being spiritual. Yeah. And I completely agree. I think it's completely mechanistic. Um, I don't see it as a spiritual pursuit at all. But I am wondering, like the idea of using the word you and looking for you, it seems perfect and it does the job. I, I do believe that. But I wonder that when people do bring awareness to that feeling of me, and let's say they see that it can't be harmed or helped or any of that, that seems to be, um, it seems to lead people naturally to start making assumptions, spiritual assumptions. And I wonder how for you... For a while. For a while. During the recovery, you, I think. Okay, because I wonder how you, you kind of short-circuit that, because it's so tempting. I know. I, it's so I, tempting to turn the it only, into... The only thing, I, I am becoming more and more fierce about, uh, you know, like calling attention to the fact that when somebody speaks to me about, mm -hmm. and I know that they, they themselves, because I know them over a period of time, mm -hmm. and when somebody speaks to me and tries to equate that, and, and I'll tell you, there's one or two people who, who uh, really fit this bill, I, I just call their attention to it. I say, That's, that, that doesn't have anything to do with it. That's beside the point, mostly. Right. Mostly right. what I point out is that that there is beside the point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it's true or false, it's just beside the point. And uh, I have found that, and I'm thinking of somebody in particular, that I have seen people who have actually uh, clearly broken the trance, mm -hmm. clearly and still retain uh, a, a kind of allegiance and uh, affection for the, the, the terminology of spiritual aspiration, which, which as you know, I think is a false trail and, and, and makes me things harder rather than easier once the looking is accomplished. But I've seen people who seem to be so steeped in that that they would never mm -hmm. uh, be able to abandon it. And then I'll see them the next time, and it's all gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I try to, I try to uh, be helpful to people when I, when I see them talking about stuff that just doesn't mm -hmm. have anything to do with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am very patient, it turns out. I, uh, I don't know where that came from either. <laughs> And I think that uh, patience and uh, that I've seen too many examples now mm -hmm. of the course of recovery, and it, you 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 go to the forums, you've seen some of the crazy stuff that's going on there, mm -hmm. and then people come and they talk to them, and and over time it all goes away, mm -hmm. and I've seen it over and over and over again, yeah. and that, so that what I 
say is that the persistence of those ideas, once the looking has been accomplished, is actually beside the point. It's of no big consequence. It's worthwhile to point it out when it occurs, mm -hmm. but it's on its way out. Okay. Good. And I just wanted to explicitly thank you so much and Carla, because, I mean, I've tried tons of stuff. And yeah. this is, honestly, it's the only thing that's made a significant difference. Like, it's quite, quite profound. So yeah. I just really wanted to thank you guys a lot. Well, I'm very, it's I'm really very good to did see you bring the... Uh, the paper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we're looking done. forward to yeah, seeing I'll give it to you. Yeah. Good, good. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome, Paul. Okay. Anybody else? I guess the way I see things is that, and you know, if I talk about anything in particular, whether I talk about spiritual teachings or, or uh, the act, the the drive for money or sex or drugs and rock and roll and stuff. Anything I'm talking about in particular, it may sound like I think that that's a bad thing, that, that, uh, that that's a cause of a problem, like spiritual teachings, or religion, or sex, drugs, and rock and roll. If I talk about it, that particular thing, in that moment, it will sound as if I am opposed to that, and I think that's a problem that something needs to be done about. That's never the case. What I, the actual relationship I have, the way I feel about it is that here we are in 2012. We have been on this road as, a, as human beings trying to find a solution to the problem of being human for 5,000 years, and it has got us to where we are now, where it, you know, like, uh, we seem to be trying our best to destroy ourselves. If you look at the reality of the way we're, um, the way we're operating as human beings in the world, we seem to be trying our best to destroy ourselves. And we always have seemed to be trying our best to destroy ourselves, but now, we actually have the capability of doing so. And at the same time, here has appeared something that was unexpected and, uh, and seems really silly, actually, to suggest its power, that has appeared, that actually has the chance of arresting that headlong rush at, toward the cliff of extinction which seems to be what we're about, really. It really does. And it seems like it's a close race here as, as to what's going to prevail. So, I have no interest in anything in, in anything that purports to be a solution to the problem of being human apart from this act of looking. I have no interest in spiritual practice. I have no interest in money. I have an interest in money because it takes money to keep this stuff going and that is hard, hard to come by in these times. But I have no interest in gaining personal wealth. I have no interest in learning more stuff, reading more books, I have no interest in uh, further exploration into philosophy. I used to love philosophy. I have no interest in any of that because it all now seems to me to be mostly good attempts that didn't bring us much in the end, except whatever it brought us. So it's not that I am, that I think that all of those bad turns we've made, all of those failures that we have, uh, uh, that we have engendered, I don't think they're the problem. I don't think they're the problem. I don't think that the yearning for spiritual enlightenment is the problem. I don't think that the yearning and greed for money is the problem. I don't think that the lust and rape is the problem. I don't think the murder is the problem. I don't think self-hatred is the problem. 
I think all of these things, every one of them, is a symptom of the fear of life. And, that, and I know that we have found a way to do away with that. So when I say I don't want to talk about spiritual matters, I don't want to talk about these other things, I don't want to talk about philosophy, I don't want to talk about psychology, I don't want to talk about any of that. It's not because I am trying to demonize them. All of these things are products of the human attempt to find truth and freedom. And even the most terrible things we've done have been products of a human attempt to find truth and freedom. Even the wholesale slaughter of the innocents is done from that attempt to find an end to the feeling of misery and hopelessness that afflicts the human spirit. So none of that is the problem. None of it. The problem is the fear. There is no problem apart from the fear. There is no problem apart from the, the foundation that the fear provides for the construction of a human personality. There's no problem but the fear. And while I suppose it is theoretically possible that there may be some other way to approach it, we have never found it before. And we have happened upon this simple, insignificant, silly little act of human attention, of the focusing of human attention, that reliably, really reliably, and we are contemplating um, Paul, for one, we're contemplating setting up some kind of proposal for clinical trials and things of that nature in, in uh, psychiatric uh, and psychological uh, the realm of psychology to test this thing to, to, because it seems so, I'm really kind of, it takes my breath away. You know, it took me a number of years after first kind of getting the glimpse of what it was that I wanted to get to, which was, you know, a while back, somewhere in the course of this 13 years. It has taken a while for me to become convinced myself from the results that are consistently being reported around the world that are unexpected. They're not something that would just you'd expect people to make up, even, you know, unconsciously make up. They're unexpected. They're not what you would expect people to report as success. And they reliably do, consistently do. So my entire focus and my entire the energy of everything I am doing is devoted entirely to bringing this simple act to the ears of humanity. Just that. So that when I dismiss other things, it's not because I don't see how much uh, true uh, energy, truth and energy has gone into some of these things. It's just because they are beside the point to this thing that I am trying to bring to the world. They're just beside the point, like movies are beside the point, you know, or good oatmeal is beside the point. I like oatmeal. But these things are all beside the point to this. It is, it seems more and more to be actually possible that if we could get this out into the world, everything will change, really. Not just individual human beings, but everything will change. And that kind of takes my breath away. And uh, so that's what I'm about. So thank you very much. I'll be back this afternoon. Uh, enjoy yourself. Ojai is uh, pretty nice today, a little, little cool. But at least it's sunny and it doesn't have uh, nor'easters and hurricanes. <laughs> By the way, that's our doing too, I think, some of that stuff that went back there. So be well, have a good lunch, and I'll see you at 2 o'clock. Is that what time it is? Three. 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 Oh, good. Three.
enjoy the enjoy the weather enjoy yourself enjoy yourself okay so let me get out of here and Carla probably has something that she needs to say and I'll see you at two o'clock three, three. <laughs>